our first meeting. All right, let's uh, go ahead and get started in the interest of time. Um, it's great to see all of you again. And I would like to do brief introductions um, again, just so that folks can remember who's who and who is affiliated with which organization, et cetera. Um, um, I'm happy to start. I think everyone knows me. My name is Dante. Um, I work in the commissioner's office, Department of Public Health. I'm a reproductive rights and justice attorney by background, and I do regulatory stuff and policy projects um, for the Connecticut Department of Public Health. Um, and we'll just follow the same format where um, if folks can just give us your name and your affiliation, it does help people kind of understand where you're coming from. Um, that would be great, Chris. You're muted. Yep, I got it. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Chris Andresen, and I'm the Chief of Practitioner Licensing and Investigations here at the Department of Public Health. I'm working with Dante on this. Thank you. And um, I'll send it over to Priya. Hi, um, my name is Priya Morgenstern. I am not affiliated with any particular organization in relation to this conversation. Um, I am a public interest attorney, and I was a midwife for a number of years before I switched careers. And this is a topic near and dear to my heart. Thank you. Priya, you can popcorn to somebody if you want, if it helps move it along. All right, I'll send it over to Ida. Oh, well, thank you. I'm Ida Dara. I'm the executive director of the North American Registry of Midwives, otherwise known as NARM. We issue the Credential Certified Professional Midwife, or CPM. That is the basis for a licensure in the states that license direct entry midwives to attend births in out-of-hospital settings specifically. So I do work with a lot of states as they draft their laws and their regs. I give um, from my experience of working with all the other states, I give perspectives on um, on what works well and what is sometimes problematic. So I'm here really as a resource and because it is really relevant to NARM to know what's going on in the state, mm -hmm. if there's a new law proposed or what's being proposed or how it relates to the CPM. And sometimes just a little bit of a language tweak makes all the difference in the world is whether you can actually do it that way or not. You know, so I, I'm kind of coming from NARM's perspective on how to get good language. And thank you, Priya, for inviting me in here. I've known Priya for a long, long time, and she's the one who let me know that you were having these discussions that I couldn't make the first one, but I will be here for the, the last three. Thank you. And I don't know who to popcorn. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> I can only see four people at a time. Is there a way to like do a gallery view so we can see everybody? Yeah, if you're a nine, you can do a. Hmm, you Sorry. should do a gallery view if you uh, click on you, click on the three dots that say more, okay. and yeah. then if you go down, it gives a gallery view. It doesn't have everybody, um, but it has. You'll get a more than I think you said four that will give you like nine people. You can also check out the together mode. That's kind of a fun one. <laughs> All right. If it works. Oh, we don't have it anymore. Oh, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wait. If you go to large gallery now. Yes. Okay. You get right. more people that way. Yeah. Wow. There's a lot of people here. Yeah, it's great. Um, okay. So uh, did you popcorn it to somebody, Ida? Uh, Sarah. <laughs> See you there. <laughs> Folks, we're just redoing our introductions because we have some new faces today. Hi, my name is Sarah Gadboys. I am a um, midwife here in Connecticut. I own Primal Roots Midwifery, and I'm currently on maternity leave. So if oh. there's noise, it's the baby in my lap. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Um, I'll send it over to L'Oreal. Goodness. Oh, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Hi, I'm L'Oreal Keys. I'm a midwife here in Connecticut working with Sarah at Primal Roots. Um, I'm happy to be here. Excited to see what comes of this. I do just want to say that I know the last meeting that we had, there were a few of the midwives that I've been connected with that weren't able to 
come into the meeting and um, a few of them are having a hard time with the link. So I don't know if that can be sent out again so they can attend, um, but a lot of they're having a hard time finding the link to access the meeting right now. Can you um, maybe email us who they are real quick and then we can make sure we get it to their email addresses? Sure. Thank that you. would be great. Thanks, L'Oreal. And you can popcorn it to somebody else to continue the introductions. Oh, goodness. Like, who's here? <laughs> um, Kara. Thanks, L'Oreal. Um, I'm Kara Crawford. I'm a an out-of-hospital, non-certified midwife uh, here in Connecticut. I have a, a little solo practice and I've been practicing for about six years now. Um, and I'm, I'm looking forward to just continuing these conversations and listening and learning and um, seeing how we can figure this stuff out. Thanks. Kara, can you pass it along to somebody else? Yes, so sorry. Thank you. Um, okay. How about Denji, She's right in front of me. Right. Hi, I'm Genji Proto. I'm here representing the Connecticut chapter of the, Nas uh, the NACP, <clears throat> National Association of Certified Professional Midwives. I do have my own practice here in Connecticut, and um, yeah, I'm, th I'm happy to be here. Thank you. I'll send it over to Michelle. Hi, I'm Michelle Telfer. I'm a certified nurse midwife and the co-director of the Midwifery Educational Program at Yale. Oh, send it over to Amy Romano. Uh -huh. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. There we go. Hi, everyone. Um, nice to see folks. I'm Amy Romano. I uh, was a home birth CNM in Connecticut for a number of years and, and also have both worked and managed operationally uh, birth centers in a number of states, um, not in Connecticut. Um, I have a company called Primary Maternity Care that's based here. I live in Milford, Connecticut, and um, but we do work kind of around the country with different um, projects, and we do work here in Connecticut related to the doula, the implementation of the doula um, benefit. Um, yeah, that's um, that's me, and I will. Let's see, is it Shana, or um, have you gone yet? I'm Shana, and I have not come yet. Thank you. Um, I work for DPH as Chris's administrative assistant. I'm here to learn a lot and work alone. So, um, I will pass this along. Did everyone go already? Mary Lawler, have you gone yet? No, I haven't. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> so I'm Mary Lawler. Um, I was a, had a 37 year home birth practice and I've been a birth center owner in New Hampshire since 2008. And I uh, came from the National Association of sort of came through the National Association of Certified Professional Midwives. I, I'm no longer with them. I, my last month was February, but I was there for 20 years. Uh, and in that capacity, I worked a lot with the states on on uh, some, some of the things that Ida does as well, um, uh, including uh, language, you know, legislative language, regulatory issues, birth center issues. So um, I'm just really pleased to be here and learn and contribute in any way that I can. Oh, somebody else. Uh, Michelle, no, you, you went already. Uh, I don't see that. Let's see, uh, Christian, there you go. Hi everyone, I'm Christina Mukon. Um, I am the health policy chair for the Connecticut APRN Society. And um, I am here because we have considered ourselves to be representing um, clinical nurse midwives as well as part of APRNs, although we discussed last week, a lot of midwives do not consider themselves APRNs. Um, and we are also here as just advocates for uh, patient safety and advocacy and access within the state. And I'll pass it off to Kim. Well, thank you, Christina. Kim didn't go. 
Hi, everybody. I'm Kim uh, Kim Sandor. I'm the executive director of the Connecticut Nurses Association. And by professional background, I am a nurse and a family nurse practitioner. And I uh, do a lot of work in the field um, of early childhood, supporting children and families from underserved and underrepresented um, areas. So happy to be here. And how about I pass it to you, Karen Buckley Bates? <laughs> Thanks so much, uh, Karen Buckley. I'm the Vice President of Advocacy at the Connecticut Hospital Association. I'm happy to be here. I joined a little bit late, so I'm not sure if there's anyone else who has not introduced themselves. So if you have not, feel free to raise your hand and speak up and introduce yourself. We do have a couple left and there's some that just joined. So if you want to speak up, go ahead if you're uh, just joining us. Hi. Can everyone hear me? Hi, Carolyn. Do you want to go ahead and introduce Hi. yourself? We have some new uh, new faces today. Oh, okay. Um, my name is Carolyn Greenfield. Um, I run Joyful Home Birth. Um, <clears throat> I've been in practice for three years. Um, been very, very busy. And um, so my my training took place um, quite a, quite a lot of my training in Houston, Texas, um, where they do license and regulate midwives. Um, so I generally do about 25 births a year, 25 or so. And um, so I just wanted to be a part of this whole process and learn about it and, you know, get involved. Um, so I live in Summers, Connecticut. I serve all of Connecticut um, as far away as Greenwich, um, you know, all over Connecticut. And um, I'm married. I have four kids. Uh, one of them was a home birth baby. And uh, yeah, I mean, I'm just, uh, you know, really enjoying my career as a midwife, like he helping families. So uh, that's about it. Great, thanks. Uh, we have a few more new folks that have joined. I think Angie, Diana, or um, Camille might have just joined. Hopefully everyone had a success with the link now and no one else is having a hard time putting in. Feel free to introduce yourselves, guys. Hi there, I'm Angie. I am a CPM. I'm here in New Haven County, and I'm together with my colleagues. Hey, Sayana. I'm Sayana. I'm a CPM student. I apologize for missing the last session. I was traveling. Happy to be here. Um, I'm going to Amica accredited school, Midwives College in Utah, and I'm getting my clinical skill here in Connecticut. Great, thank you. Anyone else? Hi, can, can you guys hear me? Yep. Hi, my name is Camille Grant. I am a CPM trained midwife, but I'm currently practicing traditionally in the state of Connecticut. Hi, I'm Joni Stone. Um, I am here representing uh, the CT and a CPM, and I am also a CPM working here in midwifery with Circle of Life Midwifery. Um, and <laughs> I'm John, um, and I'm a midwifery student. Uh, hopefully going for a CPM. Great. Did everyone get a chance to introduce themselves? I think we got through everyone. Awesome. Dante, sorry, I, I need to figure out where this hand raising button is. Oh, there it is. Um, there's one person that sent me an email that said trying to get through, but the link isn't working. Is there oh, I, I think she's Marianne? here. I think it's Marion. Yeah, Marion. Oh, she just accepted it. I see that. Okay. Perfect. Hi, Marion. Can you hear us? Yes, thank you. No problem. You came in at just the right moment. We're just wrapping up introductions. We have some new faces today, if you don't mind introducing yourself to the group. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Sorry, sorry I'm late. I think I was no using problem. an old link. Um, I'm Marion Seliquini. I'm a certified midwife in, I actually live in New York. Um, I'm director of midwifery services at a large FQHC here, but um, I'm also chair of a committee for ACNM, um, the CMAC committee, which specifically works on um, supporting states to license certified midwives. So thanks. Wonderful. Uh, thank you all so much for uh, taking time again to, to come together um, to talk about this. Just briefly, there are, there are reminders of 
video is great if it's possible for you um, mute when you're not speaking and unmute when you are speaking. And uh, last time I, it seemed to work okay to raise hands when we're having a, a big discussion because there are a lot of us. But if you want to keep um, contributing through the chat, I'll do my best to monitor that and make sure that um, if people want to communicate their thoughts that way that they are shared and, and uh, attention is brought to them as well. Um, I'm going to start by just sort of doing a recap of some of the themes that I noticed in our conversation last week. And then if people want to chime in or build on them, um, that would be great. We can also use this as an opportunity to fill in the folks who weren't in our first meeting. Um, so I guess the first sort of takeaway from our conversation was really that uh, midwifery is midwifery. It's its own profession. It's a distinct profession. It sounds obvious it, to say this, but it's not a medical approach to childbirth. And uh, the, so the take the takeaway was really that this is a distinct model of care, whether in whatever setting it might be practiced in. And so that was something that seemed to be a common thread in uh, a lot of what people were expressing. And that that really spanned uh, the pathways to midwifery. People felt a uh, a sort of identification with the midwifery profession or the midwifery model of care, whether uh, your background is as a CNM, a CPM, a CM, or a traditional midwife, there was a lot of commonality in that, in that, um, that sort of concept of the distinct profession. And then we also talked about how um, licensing on its own would not necessarily be sufficient, licensing or other forms of regulation to address other policy barriers or practical barriers. And so I think um, just to address that briefly, what I wanna say is that for the purposes of our group moving forward, we do need to focus on the regulation piece of it somewhat distinctly because that's our mandate as a group and um, given the time that we have um, in these meetings. But I don't think it means that we need to uh, close doors to other potential policy conversations uh, down the road. Um, I have talked about this repeatedly with my policy director. She's not on this call, but she might be able to join a future one. Um, and I think I can say this, uh, you know, as a department in our policy office, we are interested in enhancing and advancing midwifery broadly moving forwards. And um, that will include uh, birth center uh, facility licensure moving forward. And so I really want uh, this group to take away that even if we can't sort of get into the nitty gritty of all of the uh, different issues that come up that may not be addressed directly by the regulate the licensing or regulation piece of it, um, I still want you to know that all of your diverse views should be included moving forward and that we'd like to keep talking to you um, about ways that we can advance midwifery in a broader uh, way. And then the other theme that we had was, um, let's see. Yeah, just related to that, there seemed to be interest in the group um, of sort of thinking about how midwives might serve the goals of addressing both improving outcomes for all, but also particularly addressing disparities. And so that's a conversation we can keep having as well. Um, but back to um, regulation itself, there was some consensus on not wanting collaboration or supervision requirements. And we can talk about how other states have phrased that um, and sort of talk about what it means. Um, there was some conversation about uh, beginning conversations about transfer agreements. And I think um, in the resources I sent around, we, we can see there is some evidence that when regulation is more favorable to midwives, it helps make that link to improved outcomes. Um, so we can sort of learn from all of you here, especially some of those folks that uh, we're lucky to have here who have experience about this in so many states, <laughs> exactly how uh, different framing of transfer protocols or agreements or collaboration or supervision um, might impact outcomes. And then at the end of, the, of our meeting, we talked about the current legal landscape here in Connecticut under the Albini case. And, um, you know, as it stands now, the legal system um, really is the last word on defining that line between normal birth and care that exceeds um, 
I guess, the, the scope of mid or free. Um, and so we ended our conversation by starting to talk about uh, the difference between administrative review and criminal or civil uh, legal review of midwifery practice. And then finally, uh, we discussed sort of a tension between licensing, and I think we'll probably have much more conversation about this. Licensing is potentially the most restrictive category of regulation because it does define who can't hold themselves out as a midwife. But on the other hand, what we're starting to learn from other states is that voluntary certification won't necessarily be create a pathway to reimbursement parity. Um, so that's a tension that uh, sort of needs to be thought through. And so I think that that is, those were my main notes from last week, but I'd love to open it up to folks who um, remember other key things that came to mind, things they learned, things that they um, see differently. I'm happy to, to just open the floor at this point, if anyone wants to chime in. I'm worried I'm not gonna see everybody's hand. Okay, I'll, I'll put a hand up. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, uh, and I'm sorry that I wasn't here for the first <laughs> meeting, but one of the most important um, comments I like to make when a, a state is looking at this is that the law needs to be very specific about who's doing the regulating and who is regulated and kind of what the process is. Whereas regulations do better to address specifics about scope of practice and that those regulations can be specific to uh, which midwife is being licensed. You can license all credentials under one, um, one process. Sometimes you have different scopes for each of them but not necessarily entirely different systems for it. But trying to keep the individual regulations out of the law, because when the law gets to running pages and pages and pages about every lab test you do and when and why and what's normal and not normal, it makes the law extremely cumbersome and very hard to not only interpret, but very hard to update with anything. And so that is the main recommendation. Keep your basic structure of a law, who's regulated and who's doing the regulating and the process, and then the regulations that address issues regarding scope of practice. So that's, that's my introductory comment. Thank you, Ida. And that's something that I, I uh, noticed when I was looking through um, you know, state examples that there's a wide variety of what goes into statute versus what goes into regulation. And it's interesting, even just here in the New England region, for example, um, like Rhode Island, I think pretty much just tells the state to make regulations and then everything goes into regulation. Whereas in Maine, everything is in the statute and there's like nothing in the regulations at all. Um, and so that seems to me, um, what, you know, a huge difference from state to state. And um, I don't know, Chris, if you want to talk through how that works in Connecticut, it seems like also from profession to profession, there can be some variation between what, how much gets put in statute, how much detail versus how much goes into regs. Yeah, um, thank you. And so I, I know in Connecticut, and this is just my experience, that for us generally, it's easier to change a statute than it is a regulation. The regulations <laughs> process is very, is very cumbersome. Okay. Um, um, so to the extent that things can be just put in the statute um, and are clear, um, you know, that's sort of our preferred way. And then we add regulations if sort of there's, there's clarification needed. But many of the professions that Connecticut regulates um and we regulate like i mean just in my office we regulate like 70 professions and many of them have no regulations attached to them um everything is in the statute and it's you know sometimes it, depending on the profession it can be a couple paragraphs um or you know something like a physician or um, nursing it's, it's a little bit longer um but but that's been sort of my experience with um statutes and regulations in Connecticut. Um, but 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 there is, you know, there is a good point to, you know, making sure that whatever is in there, you know, to the extent possible does not 
box us into something that um, you know, we may need to change later. I mean, sometimes you want things boxed in, but there's other times where you want that flexibility and sometimes sort of broad statutory <laughs> language provides a lot of flexibility that once it's once it's in force, sometimes we'll go, oh, gee, you know what? This is actually confusing. Um, this is not clear to folks. It's not clear to us. So, you know, what? we may need to create some regulations to help clarify that. So that that tends to be how it works in Connecticut and you know, talk about how every state is a little bit different. So, Christina, I see your hand up. Um, just piggybacking on what Chris said, we we don't always have a ton of regulations on the license and scope specifically, but we have a ridiculous amount of regulations on specific practice and location and payment qualifications, like with DSS and under DPH, we have a ton related to. Um, who who's able to do things at different locations, even though it's not under scope of practice. Yeah, and if people want some clarity on the um, process and sort of like wh who gets to be the decision maker, I guess, um, I'm happy to explain a little bit um, if that would be helpful just here in Connecticut. Yeah, Dante, I know you're going to um, go into more like the difference between regulations and licensing and all yeah. of that later on. But um, but yeah, whatever you think is important to say at this moment for clarity would be really helpful. It sounds like there's regulation means something different from state to state, just less like licensing means something we, different. From state it to could state. be the process. A lot of times with laws, it's sort of like how they're made. I think like Ida was saying, it's like how they're made and who's making them, right? So statutes have to be approved by the legislature. And so for anything to do with public health that can come from us, it has to go through the public health committee. We have a joint committee. So the process is relatively streamlined in that sense. And maybe that's part of why um, because of the way that our legislature is organized that way, maybe that's part of why it's easier for statutes to move forward and actually like get across that finish line um, compared to regulations. So the statute will give an agency like DPH, um, DPH is technically part of the executive branch of government. We're kind of like a very distant arm of the governor's office really. Um, so by passing a statute, the legislature says agency you have authority to regulate on X, Y, or Z, and they kind of set the boundaries within which then regulations get made. Um, and that is an internal process first, but it still has to go through uh, various cycles of external review. It's just that the regulations are drafted by the agency um, with all kinds of input at different points. Uh, it could be a work group goes into the initial framing of the of the regulation. It could be through public comment later in the process, ultimately still has to get rubber stamped by a committee of the legislature, but the whole sort of decision-making process is much more internal to the agency. And, and the main sort of legal check when it comes to the, the creation of the regulations is that it has to stay within whatever prescribed authority, statutory authority you are drawing from. So basically, again, the, the statute says, okay, you can create regulations up to this boundary, but you can't cross this line or that line. And then you make your regulation and make sure that it stays within what you're allowed to do, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, Karen. Um, so I just wanted to clarify one thing. The <clears throat> regulation review committee is not necessarily a rubber stamp. In fact, it's another opportunity for people to advocate for things they may or may not want. So I just don't want people to think that regs that are drafted just yeah. pass that way because they don't usually. <laughs> yeah. I think as, it's, as it's someone who lobbies that committee on a variety of things, um, oftentimes things get punted from the legislature to the regulation committee because the legislature doesn't want to deal with it during the legislative session and mm -hmm. they think the agency will just do it, but it just moves the discussion to another venue at another time. So I just, I didn't want folks here to think that, like if everything went well in this conversation exactly what you wanted and then regs happened, that that just meant everything was going to happen well there because that's not necessarily what will happen. So I just 
wanted to be transparent about that. Yeah, definitely. And and the public comment process obviously is truly public um, when it comes to um, regulations being drafted. Correct. So. Yeah, um, any questions on that point? Okay. Genji has her hand up, it seems. Okay, great, Genji. Yeah, I was just wondering, so just to clarify, it's what you said, Karen, so the, the, the regulation review committee, is that an internal process? You said it's another opportunity for a review, but, but review by who, by whom? So the, so the statutory process is a discussion that happens among the legislature during a normal legislative session. Okay. If legislation passes this as the departments have to shall or may adopt regulations, the process roughly is the department puts together a draft. It goes to the governor's office and OPM for review. Once they review it, it's publicly noticed and it's shared with the attorney general's office and there's an opportunity for public comment as was shared. The department then needs to respond to those comments, both in writing and decide whether they're going to make a change to the regulations. It goes to the attorney general's office a couple, uh, a couple more times informally and formally, and then it goes to the legislative attorneys for review, and they will make a recommendation to the regulation review committee, which the committee may or may not take. And it is an opportunity for folks like me and other advocates for on either side of the regulation to lobby the legislators not necessarily on kind of the legal uh, sufficiency, but more on the policy issues. And there could so potentially be, be a hearing, can. a public hearing, right? There could potentially be a public no, hearing. No, they do not have a public hearing for regs review. If they have a meeting to vote after the regs go to regs review, it is an opportunity for regs, the advocates like lobbyists to lobby each individual member of the regulation review committee. So, for example, <laughs> there were some regulations dealing with a process that DPH was putting forth for the licensing of people for J-1 visas. The Legislative Commissioner's Office, the attorneys said that the regs could pass because they were legally sufficient. But hospitals and other health care providers lobbied the members of the committee because we didn't think the regs would work and would cause more problems. So while the attorney said they were legally sufficient, meaning they were within the parameters of what the department was allowed to do, we lobbied the members of the committee to say, sure, they're allowed to do that, but actually won't system won't work. So we want you to reject them so they'll go back and talk with us more about it. And so they did. And we were able to then fix our words, fix the regs. <laughs> Those weren't so Chris's the regs. Just the for, just for out of that process. Say it again. I said the public's cut out of that process. Well, they're not cut out of that process because it's twofold. One, you've had the opportunity for public comment. And two, all of the people who are advocating and lobbying for someone are lobbying on behalf of members of the public. So, so like, I, sorry, go ahead. like in that situation, we were lobbying on behalf of the fact that people who don't have access to health care needed to have people who could provide health care in their area. And this would eliminate the ability to hire professionals to do that. So how does one become an advocate in this, like, you know, in this particular case, thinking if when things evolve that far, who, how do you have fair representation on that committee or in that group of advocates? So two things. One, you can always reach out to members of the regulation review committee. There are uh regulations within the state of Connecticut of who can actually register as a lobbyist so once you exceed a certain amount of um if you will benefit or cost to the work that you're doing you're supposed to register as a lobbyist in the state of Connecticut and correct me if I'm wrong but isn't that the regs committee the only one that meets throughout the year like they're not just busy during session because regs are coming at them throughout the year so right. it's not they, do meet, they do meet throughout the year yes mm -hmm. It normally takes from a regulation process about 18 months, yeah. between a year and 18 months to pass regulations in Connecticut that are not controversial. 
There is a possibility of doing emergency regulations, but they have to meet a very, very high threshold or have to do with fish. <laughs> because they have to change who can fish what fish each year based on the population of fish each year. So that's why there's an exception for fish. Interesting. Okay. Any other questions on process? Okay. Carolyn, you're muted. Okay. Um, so I know in some different states, you know, there's lots of regulation and stuff. Um, so what about like a midwifery council? You know, like, um, you know, a group of midwives that get together and I mean, I know we have the Connecticut chapter of the NACPM, which I'm a member of myself. Um, but I wonder, um, like in Idaho, they have a midwifery council um, that, you know, will give information and gather information about the proposed regulations. So just thought I'd throw that out there. No, this is Chris and, and thank you, Carolyn. Like the, the nice thing about the, the work we're doing right now is sort of like anything's possible. Um, and, you know, there, there's there's boards sometimes for certain professions. We only have a handful of boards compared to the number of professions that we regulate here at the department. Um, but there's also things like kind of what you were talking about. Right? I don't actually know if it's the same thing you're talking about, but like for community health workers, we have a community health advisory body, I believe it's called, um, and community health worker advisory body. And the the charge of that group, and this is in statute, and it, it, it helps us from having to put everything into um, regulations, but the charge of that group is to review um, like local programs that want to create a community health worker training program so that people can get certified by the state as a community health worker. And so that group has, by statute, um, has the authority to sort of review new programs and say, yeah, they hit everything on the mark. And that one, that program will qualify folks for um, uh, community health worker certification, <clears throat> or it's missing something and then they have to fix it. And once it's, you know, once it, once it meets all the um, requirements that a group like this one here um, identified as important, then it can, it can be a group for, um, 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 it, it can be a, a, a training that leads to certification. So that there are some roles that things like adv advisory bodies can play and also to advise the department about, you know, things that we're not aware of that might be going on that, you know, need to be looked at. So, so yeah, all of these things are, are, are possibilities that we're talking about. Yeah, I think that's definitely something uh, we're going to get to and, and talking about, you know, there are different ways that states have um, populated their boards and there are different ways that they're structured. Some of them are really still like an advisory kind of entity associated with the medical board as opposed to their own freestanding board. And so those are um, some key decisions that states make as they get to that point. Um, I don't know if it might be helpful to kind of walk through just by theme a little bit and we can kind of, um, you know, we don't necessarily have to stick to the resource I sent around, but we can talk about ideas on each of the sort of main um, like decision points. Um, and then folks that maybe are familiar with other states uh, can chime in about what has and hasn't worked or, or different models. Um, and so the first thing we should really talk about, and I think Ida mentioned this, is sort of who is included in midwife and is that def definition of midwife um, going to be in statute united or is there going to be a separate distinct category for CPMs, CMs, et cetera. And, and that is related to whether there are separate licensure categories if a state has licensure. So um, for example, um, you know, in New Jersey, I think they have like one single midwifery license versus a distinct, you know, places where CNMs are still licensed as APRNs. Some states don't do that, Connecticut being one of them. 
Um, so these are the kinds of initial decisions that might get made at the beginning of your of your uh, legislation or, or could be in your in your regulation. I don't know if people have thoughts about that. Priya. Um, <clears throat> not not to derail this conversation quite yet, Dante, but <clears throat> you know, stepping back from being in the weeds and talking about process. I don't know if we've really had a really fulsome discussion about what the goals would be if we were to look at different kinds of regulation. And, you know, a few that would come to mind would be what would enhance the practice of midwifery? What would make it more available and accessible to families in the state? What would make it more likely to be reimbursed? And it may be that if we have more of a discussion or have a better sure. idea about what were the goals, then maybe some of the other stuff that we'll be talking about might be a little bit. Thank you, Priya, because actually that was, um, I was gonna try to do some small groups today and I have that exact question. So what is your vision of success? And if people are ready to jump into that first, that's totally fine and we can come out of those and report back and then see, um, what makes sense to continue the discussion. So I don't know, Shana, if you're ready, but there are enough of us to do um, some short, small groups. And that's the exact question is sort of what would you define as a successful outcome from the work of this group? And, um, you know, I guess sort of what, what your vision would be, and then we can come back and report. So I don't know how many people are gonna be in group, Shana, do you know? So what I can do is, there's about 20 of you, excluding Dante and myself. Um, so what I can do is I can set this to where it seems automatically just to sign mm -hmm. Perfect. everyone to a group, which will take less time to figure out. Um, That's great. In turn, we'll give you more time to have your discussions in your groups. And we'll just keep it to five minutes. And then if you can sort of, as we'll give you a warning when you have like a minute left and you can kind of nominate somebody to report back the diversity of views of um, what folks are are thinking about that. Jenji, do you have a question? Yeah, I, I um, there's something, I, I don't, you guys are in charge of facilitating the group and all of that, but there's something about the breaking into small groups that's making me feel uncomfortable. Um, I, I, for one, would be really interested in just hearing like organically from each person what their, um, you know, what their model, what their, I forget exactly how you just said it, what their ideal goal or outcome would be. I think okay. that there's, there's a lot to be gleaned or a lot to be lost by, you know, not hearing from people directly on that. I, I don't think that, I think that this group is diverse enough that that's going to be um, really tricky to like summarize and we're going to end up hearing from everybody anyway. So I don't know. I just wanted to to say that I'm happy to go along I'm with what I think. That. Yeah, that's fine. Do, do people but, feel the same way? Is that kind of a consensus? Okay. We don't have a, a model for uh, expressing our, you know, we could vote, but maybe some people don't want to <laughs> like raise their hand or anything. Uh, that's totally fine with me. If we just want to keep it open, that is totally fine. So um yeah, I'm happy to, to just hear your thoughts on what folks at this stage, and it's okay if that changes, you know, what might, you might have come in before last week's <clears> meeting, <throat> a certain idea, and then maybe that's evolving, or maybe by the end of our, our working group, you'll have a totally different idea of what success is, and that's okay too. Christina. I can start the conversation with what I see as a good goal of success then. So what I would picture as the end definition would be improved, safe, high quality access to care um, of whatever services that was going to be. And I realize that's very broad, but to me, making sure that it's that safe, high quality is imperative before we're saying increasing access. Because if we were increasing access to something that was a different level of care, that would not be the goal. And that has to be the, the primary imperative of anything that we came up with. Does 
anyone else uh, want to share either a similar or different understanding of success? Kimberly. Hi, um, this is Kim with the Connecticut Nurses Association. Uh, yeah, I go along. Thank you, Christina, for saying that so nicely. I never say anything in few words, so I appreciate someone who can do that. Um, but uh, to build on that is, you know, to look at the um, models of other health, of other people providing health services that aren't your licensed nurse or doctor, right? Um, and to draw similarities and parallels to those, those professions and how they are licensed or have oversight requirements on malpractice board over, you know, like that kind of stuff. Um, so that there was, I don't, I don't know if it's parody is the right word, but that um, the end, we get to that end result Christina was talking about that, you know, we have uh, a safe, a safe, a safe standard that's similar to approaches that we have put in place with other professions. Kim, could you just clarify which professions you're thinking of? Well, like I, you know, I think about, so I had an offline conversation. So, you know, I'm a, again, I come from a very medical model, right? I'm a family nurse practitioner. I feel like I'm a holistic nurse in that approach, but um, let's say, you know, the difference between an ophthalmologist and an optometrist or a podiatrist and orthopedic, um, hmm. you know, there's different way, you know, there's different ways to uh, provide care. There's a PA, there's an APRN, and you have an MD, right? There, so there's different people in healthcare. There's overlap in a lot of the different work that we do, but our professions are different and distinct. Um, but the, we still look for uh, some sort of parity or similarity in those professions in being able to perform certain functions safely. So just you know, like as we looked at APRNs or naturopaths wanting to prescribe medications or um, PAs in their scope of practice, you know, often we look back on education, training, expertise, the whole kind of thing in addition to those outcomes. So that's kind of, I don't know if that makes sense. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Priya. Um, I'm sort of looking at this a little bit differently. I don't think I don't think we need to try to establish the safety, the efficacy, or the benefits of midwifery care. I think that's been done ad nauseum for decades. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that what I would consider to be a set of ideal outcomes here would be if there was some way to recognize midwives in a way that facilitates the enhanced delivery of care as between um, community midwives and other practitioners, especially for purposes of transfer, but for all other reasons, um, something that would enhance the practice of midwives that would enable them to, um, for example, safely carry drugs and prescribe them and be able to seek tests, something that would enhance access to their care by providing reimbursement and enabling midwives, for example, to own healthcare cent um, birthing centers. And um, yeah, I think I think the goal is to make midwifery care, which it's being delivered safely right now, but make that available to as many people as possible in a way that um, is respected by everybody. And it's not this like bastard profession. That's sort of where I'm coming from. Great, thank you, Priya. Uh, Chris, I can I just make here. a quick comment? I, Priya, by no way did I mean to imply that it's not a safe care. <laughs> um, I, I My first child was delivered by a nurse midwife. I'm full in on that. Yeah, side I appreciate thing. that. My, no, my comment is more in line with, um, you know, when you bring in licensure and certification and oversight and regulation, it does change 
right? It does change who does. is fitting into what kind of category. And as you're looking at how do you make those decisions, looking for similarity between the way it was done before. Okay. So like we talk about APRNs have to be certified nationally and have to have gone to a master's program that has had this many hours of pharmacology and X, Y, and Z. So that's really where I'm going. Yeah, I think the profession is well established. It's like looking at um, that other piece. So please, I, that is not, I, did, I just I got that. from your response that you were like whoa baby that's not <laughs> so i just i want well, for the record for the there's record one thing, there's one more thing i wanted to mention also from the perspective of enhancing practice um also i do you know i do i am concerned for midwives who you know even the most competent skilled practitioner of any kind can oversee something make a mistake drop a ball and it concerns me Everybody here knows this because I've said it before. It concerns me that midwives are currently very vulnerable, um, you know, without some sort of regulation behind them, vulnerable to criminal prosecution for things that should be handled administratively within healthcare regulation. So that was the other thing I want to mention. Thanks. That's helpful, Priya. Thank you. Uh, uh, Chris, I think you have a comment. I did just a couple of quick things and thank you everybody. I'm I'm just loving hearing what everybody's saying. And a couple of things for me that I think are important when we're creating any type of regulation for a profession. And um, the first thing is um, that you know whatever is established, it to the extent possible, it it permits the professional to practice to the full extent of their training. Um, you know, that's that's what part of this process is. Um, and then the other part is, is that whatever requirements are established don't unnecessarily exclude somebody from working in the field or being part of the profession. I mean, I think we can all agree, like, not everybody should be a midwife right now. Just go out and do it. I mean, I shouldn't be doing it. Um, but, you know, everybody on, well, not everybody, but all the midwives on this screen, you know, they have experience, they have training that have, that make them, you know, good to go with this. So, you know, how do we capture that? How do we capture those requirements so that that whole pool of folks out there um, are eligible and that also that the pool of folks out there are um um, able to practice to the full extent of their training, um, whatever that is. Those are my couple of caveats. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Marion, I see your hand raised. Yes, actually, like some of what Chris just said was on my mind to say that, um, like, I, I think a measure of success would be would be decreasing barriers to midwives being able to practice in Connecticut and people being able to find midwives for their care in Connecticut. And, and that means midwives being able to practice to the to the full extent of their training and education, just like Chris said, that was one thing I wanted to say. Um, yeah, decreasing barriers and really bringing uh, an eye towards towards like what barriers stand in the way for diversifying the midwives in the state so that the midwives take it like reflect the communities that they're taking care of and can really help address some of those health disparities that 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 deserve attention. Thank you, Marianne. Uh, next, I see Karen. Um, so I just wanted to kind of piggyback on uh, what Chris had said. So one of the goals always of licensure or recognition is to exclude those who might otherwise call themselves that but not meet the criteria necessary to do the work, right? So one of the things to think about as you're going through this is do you want anyone to be able to to use that terminology of midwife or is it only people who do kind of x y and z right because there will be people right that's part of the regulatory structure is to prevent those from using that term who are otherwise not qualified and it is also to protect the public so that if karen says i'm a midwife and i'm not 
that there's some mechanism for the public to be able to check that and to rely on the department to act in a way to hopefully prevent or take action against someone who might otherwise act inappropriately. So I I suspect all of you are thinking with the framework of I'm a midwife, I have this training, I have this certification, I have this skill set. But part of the regulatory scheme is to prevent those who should not be calling themselves that to set a standard by which they can't use those um, and misrepresent themselves to the public. So I think um, that's just something to think about in the regulatory structure. And I think the other thing, and I'm not advocating one way or the other, is just an awareness that if you move to more of a statutory recognition or licensure model, the reason that process works is because the department can take action against the license uh, of the individual, which then ultimately impacts potentially their ability to practice in the future. So it's just something to think about. It's just uh, part of the conversation and the discussion. Ida. I think it's important to also keep in mind the perspective of the public and there needs to be a, a public person on any committees or boards. I think there, there are reasons the public chooses a midwife and one hazard of regulation is removing the midwife's ability to address what the public sees as their need. And that can be um, a conflicting situation that people who want a midwife's care find themselves not actually allowed to go and see that midwife. And I think we have to keep that in mind because what can happen is you can create a whole underground world of midwives who they don't meet any qualifications, but they're there because the public is demanding that there be midwives to help serve their needs. And, and so whatever regulations come about or whatever restrictions are laid out, you have to balance that. Um, are, are, you, are you removing the public safety aspect by not allowing those mothers to see the midwives? Or are you doing what you can to assure that these mothers have the safest care they could get with a with a trained provider um, available to them. Thank you, Ida. Uh, Lucinda. Hi, everyone. Hi, um, I just, I, so I'm just, my um, reason for wanting to be a part of the regulatory process is not, um, is not punitive. Looking because I I, cause I think regulation is important. I'm not saying it's not important, but any profession you have people who, whether they're licensed or not, may not practice safely. So if this situation is not unique to midwives, but I think we always have that thing attached to it, and I want this to be a process that no longer says that. That we already know, like someone mentioned, I think it was Priya. You mentioned how midwives we already proved that they're safe. You know what I mean? So I just don't want this process to be punitive. I don't want history to repeat itself, where it's used as the way to, to eliminate the profession, to cause problems. So I'm just saying that I just feel like there should just be a process that supports and strengthens midwifery and lets us who, who those who are trained. And again, with any license, whether it's um, nurse midwife, nurse practitioner, doctor, whatever you are, you have to be trained, but it doesn't guarantee that you're gonna be safe all the time, 100%. And just like someone mentioned, you can have a normal situation and things can turn very sour quickly. And that can happen with any profession. So I'm just saying, I just don't want this process to be another punitive way that we try to control obstetrics, that we try to control midwifery. Mm -hmm. that anyone who has been trained is able to practice. And I think that's the goal that mo what the most people want. So I'm just saying, I don't want that to be lost in this process. Thank you, Lucinda, for sharing that. Uh, Kim, do you have your hand up for another comment? No, I just been put it down. Um, sorry. <laughs> no problem. Carolyn. <clears throat> Um, so I just wanted to say some things. Um, I started my midwifery journey in 2014. And so I've been to different states that have licensure um, during my training period. I'm uh, PEP trained uh, through NARM. And also wanted to mention that I just got my bridge certificate, which is part of the US uh, MIRA, you know, the 
a group of um, organizations. And so um, being in Houston, Texas for a year and a half, um, I have a unique perspective as far as, you know, being in a non-licensed state like Connecticut and then going to Texas and, you know, I'm in the Houston area, which is, you know, as we know, Houston is huge. And so I kind of feel like um, there was a real sense of community there, even as large as, you know, Houston's like the fourth largest city, you know, in the country. Um, and I got to see as a student midwife what the regulation was like there. And, you know, they they would, you know, work on things, you know, together, like say if there was breach delivery and, you know, so they put in something in place to make sure that, you know, you had experience with it and that there were, you know, two midwives present. Um, I remember going to a birth fair where there's 10 birth centers at, well, baby fair, basically. And um, just a real sense of community and, you know, everyone know, knew of everyone else. There were some high volume birth centers. You know, Connecticut has one birth center. So when I came back to Connecticut, um, it just felt like midwifery was underground, you know. <laughs> so uh, and there wasn't to me, there just wasn't a real sense of community with the other midwives. So I'm hoping that regulation will, number one, uplift you know my profession to um a level where you know we are respected and we are um treated you know as a as a professional which i am and um that you know it will serve the the families of connecticut um to have safe home birth midwifery care so that's just just my unique perspective on everything so i just wanted to say that thank you carolyn I see a hand from Christina. Oh, hi. Yeah, I was going to comment on what Lucinda had mentioned too, because I am kind of making the parallel to the other professions too. There are people do make errors, but there is, that's why we have the accountability in place, not necessarily being punitive, um, which it sounds like a lot of midwives are coming from that experience potentially from what you said of having criminal liability but rather just making sure that there is accountability um, for if somebody is functioning outside of that standard of practice because it does happen just as you mentioned i i've known um a number of, of cases where it was a physician a parent anybody that might have been functioning outside of a standard of practice um and that is part of the process i would think with licensure is is an as um one of the other folks had mentioned it is by definition we're excluding other people potentially that might not meet that criteria to make sure that it does improve respect for the profession and ensure that safety and make sure that people that are calling themselves a midwife are able to do so safely overall okay christina uh, lucinda do you have another comment Oh, sorry, I forgot to put down my hand. No problem. Sorry. Yeah, and I think as we're going through this process, in some ways we have a very unique opportunity because um, it's a clean slate as far as out of hospital midwives in Connecticut. So when we talk through some of these, um, you know, thoughts about um, defining it <laughs> to include who does it include? We can look at who who's at this table and who's who's you know currently practicing midwifery in in Connecticut, um, and try to make it as inclusive as possible. Carolyn, do you have another comment? <laughs> does anyone have um, anything else they want to say about um, their sort of vision of a successful outcome at this time, Chris? Oh, hi, everyone. Yeah, I, so I just I just thought it'd be helpful maybe to give a little bit of context of when we talk about being a regulated profession. Um, and I know like Priya talked about that, you know, scary, like the criminal prosecution part um, versus administrative. And what we do in my office here with professions, it's, it's called administrative law. And I guess I'm the chief of this office, but um, um, so so what what happens is so sometimes, like you all said, 
I mean, why are OBGYNs liability insurance like so crazy? But but things happen. Um, things happen. And often, you know, it's a patient, a client or whoever. They want to know why they want to know what happened or did somebody do something wrong? And um, and when that happens, people can submit a complaint to the department and we look into it. Um, it's called an investigation. So we look into it and we look at the records, but but we're not experts on, we have some nurses that work here, so they're experts, but in general, we're not experts in the professions that we license or regulate. So, so say for instance, um, somebody had a bad experience, um, you, you know, and, and they were like, what, ha I can't figure out what happened. I wanna know, did, did the doctor that was, you know, um, you know, delivering my baby, did they do something wrong? And so what we do is, you know, we will request the records um, and we will then let the professional know, like, this is this is what somebody said to us. Um, you know, they said that, you know, when you were delivering their baby, they are alleging that you failed to X, Y, Z, whatever that is. And we give them an opportunity to respond and when we get that response, sometimes it's clear like, oh, OK, it's, it makes complete sense what happened. And so we're not going to pursue it. But if 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 we're not clear based on whatever the answer was, we, we rely on somebody from the profession. So so say, for instance, there was, you know, midwives were licensed or certified, whatever, in Connecticut. And. You know, uh, um, there was a, a bad outcome to the delivery and the um the the parent or the family or somebody you know that complained and said i'm concerned about the services i received we would do that you know we would say okay let's you know let, let's hear the record you know let's get the records and then what we would do is we would say okay we've got to find another midwife who's a similar midwife to this one but doesn't have a conflict of interest to kind of review the case and provide their sort of insight as to if there was anything that didn't that have, went the wrong way. Um, and usually when we do that, the person can say, no, everything, you know, everything happened the way it should have. Um, but sometimes bad things happen and that's just the way it goes. Other times they might say, you know what, um, they should have monitored this um, and that might have helped. So what we'll do in that case, and we'll give the person an opportunity to come back and kind of take a look at that. But then we might say, um, you know, so within the next six months, um, you know, we're, we're asking that you take a course in, I don't know, you know, whatever, managing blood pressure while during delivery. I'm just making that up um, so that, you know, so that in case there was any like deficiency in your training or knowledge about that, um, that'll correct that. So moving forward, you'll be good to go and that won't be there. So that's that's kind of like discipline um, generally um, on that end. I mean, if somebody does something absolutely egregious that everyone on this camera would, you know, say is horrific, um, you know, sort of the unimaginable, that that's a different story. But general sort of things that happen in medicine because you know, doctors aren't aren't magicians and, you know, human beings are complicated, you know, bodies are complicated and things happen. Um, and that's what we deal with in our office all the time. And we get tons of investigations for people that, you know, um, the vet, you know, my cat my, went to the vet and then my cat died. Um, or, you know, my grandmother went into the hospital with a respiratory infection and then this happened and this happened and then she died. Did something wrong happen? You know, and we look into it and sometimes, you know, somebody did something that might need some correction. Um, it, it's not like we go around yanking people's licenses. That's not the goal. The goal is to just ensure safety and competence. So on those rare occasions for the small percentage of providers that where there might be an issue, um, you know, there's that opportunity to intervene and say, you know, we, we, we got an expert opinion from someone who's, you know, does the same work you do and has the same similar training. And when their assessment of this was that, you know, you should have done this or whatever. So we're going to ask that you get some training on that and then you'll be good to go. So that those are sort of the types of things that are included. Um, but the actual act of getting that license, getting that certification should not be anything disciplinary. That should be, you know, sort of respectful and honor the full scope of the profession and that set of trainings that makes that person, you know, 
um, someone qualified to do that work. Um, so I just kind of wanted to clarify those two things in, in this, and I hope it wasn't help, uh, helpful and not more confusing. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. I'm going to get to um, all the hands on the list, but I just have a clarifying question about that kind of oversight that's conducted by peers. In other professions, are there sort of standards of care that they would choose to refer to when they're assessing a case, like say, did they veer off of what is a generally accepted standard of care for that particular scenario? Yeah, and I mean, and it's not always like written down in this list that somebody mm -hmm. could go check out mm -hmm. oh, the standard of care, but it's sort of like, you know, as someone who's been, say, I'm just saying a midwife, as someone who's been a midwife and practicing for 10 years and have done 500 births, you know, you know, I can say that, you know, I, I I read the records, I see what happened, I get it, you know, had the blood pressure been monitored a little better, you know, maybe this one, I mean, and again, I'm just making that up, um, monitored, you know, more closely during this or at all, um, that might have helped to avoid X, um, you know, so that's, so that's, that's how it happens, but, but we rely and, you know, and, and w once we get that from the other person who's our kind of expert witness or expert consultant, the case is closed. Okay, you're good to go. We didn't find anything, but we took a look at it. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. Understood. Um, great. I have a few more hands up. I'm going to move to um, Angie and Sayonar. Yep. Hey, Chris, I just want to make sure that we're clear about this. So if a situation arises um, with any type of midwife that falls within our whatever, whoever we're regulating, um, you would find an equivalent midwife from somewhere else without a conflict of interest who would review the record. Yeah. It wouldn't be another type of professional. It would definitely be no. another midwife. Okay. No, no, because I mean, you know, it, it it's sort of like it, it, in a sense, it's kind of like going to court. You know what I mean? Like we can't go and say, oh, we're going to have an OBGYN review what this midwife did because they're 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 different. They're not the same thing. Or, you know, if it's you know, we're not going to have a social worker review the work of a psychologist or a marriage and family therapist. It has to be somebody in the same profession. And even with physicians, you know, sometimes it's really it's really hard because, you know, say it's a um, like a specialty, like something that's rare, like pediatric cardiologist. We can't just get a cardiologist who treats mostly adults mm -hmm. to review the case. We have to find a pediatric cardiologist um, right. who is similar training. So sometimes we have to, you know, go outside of Connecticut and, and look around the country to find someone who will review the case so that we can determine, you know, if that pediatric cardiologist sort of miss the mark on something and might need some remedial training or something like that, or to, or to maybe be shadow with somebody. We, you know, we, we sometimes that's something you'll work with someone who's gonna for X number of months or X number of surgeries, whatever you're doing, um, who will be there to kind of, you know, monitor and make sure you're doing it with skill and safety. It's, it's different, you know, based on what the issue is that came up. Right, yeah. And then how are these expert witnesses chosen? Who qualifies or disqualifies the expert witness? Um, well, we have a process here to do that. So, um, so what we do is um, once once someone's part of a licensed profession, um, sometimes we include. There's like a message included on like the renewals or whatever that says, "Hey, sometimes the department you know looks for expert consultants to review cases in your profession. Let us know if you'd be interested." So. Um, they'll contact one of our staff people and she kind of keeps lists. You know, these are the APRNs, these are the psych APRNs, these are the, you know, cardiologists, the dermatologists, the social workers, whatever. And um, when we find a case, um, she will reach out to those folks and say, hey, we've got a case. Is anybody willing and available to consider taking it on? And then they have a conversation and they, you know, kind of talk about, um, you know, is this within, you know, does this sound within your your work? We want to make sure that, you know, is this the training you have? Um, you know, we want to make sure you don't know this person, because if you do, then that disqualifies you. Um, so, yeah, so it's all of, you know, that's kind of the vetting that happens. And it's typically one person, not like two or three? No, it, it's one. It's one. Gotcha. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Sarah, your hand is up next. Thanks, Dante. Um, I 
have so many thoughts because so much has been said. <laughs> uh, but ultimately, what I wanted to uh, mention was um, when we're talking about the idea of, um, you know, what what are, are our goals here? What would we like to see happen? Um, you know, I, I really appreciated the Law Review article that you sent out, and I am not sure how many people had a chance to read it, but it is phenomenal, and I would encourage anybody who did not read it to do so. Um, when you print it, it may be 24 pages, but most of it is citations, so don't be intimidated. It is wonderful, um, and again, thank you, Dante, for sending that out. Um, I, I really appreciated how it goes into um, the targeted restriction of midwifery um, providers, Trump um, laws and regulations. And, um, you know, something that we keep hearing over the last few minutes is the idea of standard of care and how that is um, what uh, a provider would be measured up against. Do they provide the standard of care? And I would like to remind everyone that midwives don't just follow the standard of care, that while the standard of care is discussed, that we are very much big on individualizing our care. And um, so, you know, it could very easily um, be seen by someone who is not um, that particular midwife working with that particular client. It could easily be seen as neglectful because it did not follow the standard of care. Um, you know, and I really appreciated um, Karen eloquently explaining that we could all come up with our ideal for regulation and licensure and um, what, you know, seems satisfactory to us. But by the time it gets to a practical level and it affects us all, it can be a completely different beast um, and it could be full of these restrictions and what this law review um, concludes um, is that because of the way that tort law just is in Connecticut and in this country, um, the regulation of midwives is what is in fact driving the lack of access and lack of choices in birth. And um, like Ida said, when you, um, you know, start to regulate and license midwives and you start to legally define and spell out um, who can and cannot be a midwife and who can and cannot access midwifery services, you then create this other effect where you have an underground network of midwives who are trying to meet the needs of those families that have been excluded. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, the question I keep asking myself and will continue to ask myself is, is it possible in Connecticut to have any sort of regulation or licensure of non-nurse midwives that does not uh, involve any of these um, restrictions, any of these um, Trump um, policies. And um, that is ultimately what is in the forefront of my mind. And I would encourage everyone to read that law review mm -hmm. article and also be considering that question as well. Thank you, Sarah, for sharing that. Uh, Kim. Um, thank you. This is Kim, CP Nurses. Uh, I just had a question about um, comments about licensure in the state and speech investigation. Um, in nursing, I know I keep talking about nursing, that's all I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> in nursing, um, we have a board of examiners of nursing and they um, manage, you know, um, things that have been brought up, maybe if a nurse, is that any better? Sorry. Give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. At least I can. <laughs> um, you know, is with so I don't know how a board is created. Is a board of you know examiners of, of midwives is that created? If there was, if we were to license CNMs, does a board get created alongside of it, or is that a second step, or does everybody who's licensed have a board? I guess is the question. Yeah, no, thank you, Kim. Um, no, not every profession has a board. Um, I I think. You know, so we have a nursing board, we have a like a, a physician's board, medical board, um, and those are very useful because there's a lot of activity that happens, you know, lots of things that come up. 
there's other professions where um, and, and I think I think midwives would be a similar profession where there's not going to be a lot of this going on. You know what I mean? There's not going to be a lot of complaints. There's not going to be a lot of. You know, things coming in that something went wrong, um, and so a board might be a little bit. An advisory body might be something helpful to pr provide input. I mean, we have boards where they meet like every quarter, every year, and then years and years go on and and you know there's never any case for them to look at or review um, versus the nursing board where they've got you know a whole list of cases to to review um, but but so there's so not most professions don't have boards actually um, but some of them have like advisory bodies and things like that too which don't have those sort of as formal function as a board and provide um, you know sort of insight or input to the the department Thanks for clarifying, Chris. Uh, Lucinda, I see your hand up. Hi, um, can you hear me OK? I'm going through, passing through some mountains. Oh, <laughs> it's a little bit. <laughs> we can hear you. OK, I just want to say that I think that we have to look to those who are already practicing in the home, who are already providing care to, this, to the, um, you know, during childbirth, because I think that we're focusing a lot on, you know, if something goes wrong, but I think that there's already a history here in Connecticut of things going right. And I think I'm just worried that again about regulations that are gonna prevent from people from doing what they're already doing. So I just wanna say that I think that we have to listen to those who are practicing now and what do they need so that they could continue to practice and feel okay and feel safe in the state of Connecticut. Thank you, Lucinda. Um... I feel like I missed a hand at some point. Um, Mary, go ahead. Oh, you're muted. Thank you. All right. I'm not sure if I'm raising or lowering my hand when I. Oh, that. you got it. You're set. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So I just want to go back to something Chris was talking about and just um, talk about the just say again the importance of having some midwifery voice, some kind of structure to ensure the voice of midwives in the. In the in the in the process of regulating midwives, not just developing it, but in, once it's developed, that there's a mechanism for that. I understand that boards are expensive and really not uh, the states aren't able to support those. But having that, that there are states where that's not true, where there, where there is no voice of midwives in the in the process, and that's not a good thing. Um, and then I I just really appreciate what the last speaker said about the importance of of really understand what standing, what midwives are already doing. You know, we do have various different um, places we can refer to and NARM and NACPM and others, other places where we can look to see definitions of scope of practice and uh, uh, those, those kinds of, um, that kind of information is available. But I really like the idea of understanding what the midwives in Connecticut are already doing and seeing uh, and what, what you refer to as the history of success. Um, so I think those are the two things I just wanted to comment on. Thank you, Mary. Uh, Lucinda, do you have uh, something else you wanted to contribute now? Otherwise we can move to Christina. Hi, I guess I have a question to all the midwives. I'm kind of piggybacking again on what Kim said. I'm totally coming from a nursing perspective. So I know that's the framework that I'm thinking of. And she mentioned the Board of Nursing. When I think of um, that, what what was just put forward of um, making sure that midwives are the ones overseeing everything, that makes total sense. So it, is it something where you guys would be the midwives in general, or are you thinking of like a board of midwifery that would be overseeing if there was a concern? Um, I guess I'm kind of asking what what the preference would be from everyone, if that was the case, knowing that, you know, if, we're, if it was going to be a formalized process, there'd have to be some form of oversight in order to move the profession forward, which it sounds like is an overall goal. Because if it's not, if there's not some type of a process in place to ensure that minimum um, training, that kind of undoes the whole, the whole initiative of trying to bring the profession forward. So that's my question to everyone. 
Does anyone uh, want to jump in on that question in particular before I go back to the list of hands? Uh, like I mentioned earlier, um, Idaho has a midwifery council, and mm -hmm. um, I think that's sort of like what she's talking about to um, or a midwifery board um, that's by the you know the midwives in Connecticut. Um, to I think that's addressing what she's asking, and there's many states that you know have this in place, and one that I can think of was Idaho, who recent that recently got licensed regulated. Mm -hmm. um, Christina, to speak, this is uh, Genji from the CTNACPM. Um, to speak to your direct question to us, I think that this is exactly something that we haven't, this exact thing we haven't talked about. I think that that's a really good question to explore. I think that there's a generally a desire to um, have more say in all the things related to midwifery in the state if there's going to be any state level things happening and so um i guess i think the short answer just having the perspective of like multiple kinds of midwives is that there we don't know <laughs> we need to talk about like what what would be best for the profession um in some ways um you know kind of if you take the what's what's been said a few times here and like overlay what is already happening in other professions and you lay it over top of midwifery, it seems like, oh, you just like fill in the blanks and you fit it all in. But there are so many nuances to to the trainings, to the families we serve, to what is holding midwifery back, depending on your credential, that it's really hard to just say there's one thing. So I don't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't speak for, and I wouldn't want anyone else just to just speak for mi all of the midwives to say, this is what we want as midwives, because we need to have that conversation as midwives first. I don't, I don't think we really, um, I, I'm not aware anyway of like any kind of unified idea on what would be best. And I think part of that actually comes from not even knowing what our options are. This, this whole conversation today and the one we had um, two weeks ago has been really helpful and I'll just speak for myself, it's been really helpful to me to start to see like, okay, if this, then here's our options and how do we feel about that and what do we want to have happen? But it's really important to understand that, you know, most midwives are living inside of what Lucinda has already described of just this, like, this, this sense of like, you're going to, you're going to be told you're doing something wrong. You have to like, keep your guard up, don't trust anybody. And at the same time, you've got these families that are like really counting on you to serve them. And so to be invited to even consider what we would want is like a groundbreaking moment <laughs> that I think we, we all, you know, would need some pause to like figure out, figure that out and kind of see. And, and some of that will depend on like what comes out of all of this, I think. So. I hope that's helpful, Christina. Thank you, Janji. Anyone else want to chime in on uh, interest in a board at this time? I, I, Go ahead. Do it quickly. So, Janji, thank you. Actually, I mean, I think you actually kind of just sort of expertly said kind of like what a big part of this whole group is. You know what I mean? That That's what it is. It's like to talk with you all especially to find out like you know this is this is this regulatory thing what do you all think how would you all like it to look if it happened and you know what what should the rules and the requirements be so that's exactly what this is yeah um, it's unprecedented chris but i think some of us are kind of going i'm not sure what to do with this you know <laughs> <laughs> this is pretty great well, i'm glad i'm, I'm, I'm sure. glad i mean i'm glad that you see it that way because that's what it was meant to be to be like inclusive and just to kind of take the temperature because i can tell you i've seen other um licensure categories you know, just be sort of, you know, put together as a category quickly, you know, and, um, and and then it happens and then people in the profession are confused and we're confused and it, you know, we find out all, we've got to kind of go back and like work it all out again to make it right. And that's what we want to avoid doing. You know, if, if this is going to happen, you know, it's critical, it's essential to have the input of midwives um, to kind of formulate it. Um, you know, and kind of talk about these things that we need to debate, the things that are confusing or feel scary. Um, you know, those are all the things that we can work through here um, and see what happens. You know, <laughs> that's it. So thank you. Thank you, Chris. OK, I'm going to move on to Ida. OK, there's one thing that I don't know much about and I'm wondering if 
are non-credentialed midwives that are normally called traditional midwives who do not hold one of these credentials. Is there a, a, a large group of those in Connecticut? Is anyone on this discussion committee representing traditional midwives? And if so, how is that? How is there a definition that identifies a traditional midwife who has a certain amount of experience or has documented, you know, knowledge and practice versus someone who just says, I want to be a traditional midwife, so let me just start. So Ida, that's a great question, actually, and I'm going to answer it. I hope you don't mind me jumping in, Dante, because yeah, I was thinking ahead. about it last night. <laughs> and, you know, like, wow, you know, and that's with a lot of professions like, you know, that that's what you, you want to, you don't want to like stop someone who's like a traditional midwife. And we don't know what that is because the only, the only thing that's defined in Connecticut right now is a nurse midwife, sort of in the laws. It's a nurse midwife. So everyone else is, um, you know, doing midwifery, whether it's traditional, whether it's CPM, whether it's certified midwife, whatever. Um, but, but yeah, it, it's important. And I think, and I was thinking about some of the different statutes with some professions and even like ones with licensure, they might say, you know, in order to call yourself a, I don't know, I'm, I'm trying to think of some profession, but whatever, in order to call yourself a nurse, you know, you must meet this criteria. But then down below, there's like a, a section, and I don't know if this is related to the nurses right now because all the statutes get confused in my head sometimes, but there's a section where it's called exceptions. And it will say, you know, the, the provisions of this chapter in the statutes shall not apply to, um, say, a traditional nurse midwife, you know, and that would be defined or may not apply to someone who's, you know, doing this in the context of, you know, a, a religious organization or whatever. There, there's always exceptions for not always, but there's there's an opportunity to put in exceptions for folks who, you know, should still be able to do it, but might not fall into the category of that person who becomes licensed um, for exactly for what you're talking about. It's often sort of with, um, you know, sort of like traditional stuff that people have been doing for years that suddenly has become like more of a, a different looking profession a little bit, but kind of does the same thing, if that makes any sense. Um, so so yeah, there, there's real opportunities to talk about that and to look at like if we said, yes, we want to license midwives, um, but but who do we want to make sure doesn't get, you know, kicked to the curb um, when that happens and allows them to do what they've been doing. So um, yeah, no, that's, that's an excellent point. Just to jump in um, on the resources I sent around before this meeting, there are several uh, links to how states have formulated those exemptions if people need to refer to them um, just now or in the future, just if you wanted to see how other states have phrased those kinds of exemptions for traditional midwives. Um, I think Joni, you were next. Hi, yes, I apologize that uh, it says Nathaniel. It's just, That's my son. I have no idea why it's on there and I can't seem to change it, so. No problem. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, this has been, a, it's, I guess, to piggyback on Genji, um, you know, this is a, it is a tricky question. I think, like, what's our measure of success? What does that mean here? Mm -hmm. I think because, you know, I, we're very grateful to have been invited to this discussion and this table and, um, the spirit in which it's been represented to us, we're really grateful for that. Um, yeah, I have been here for tw almost 23 years and um, have been a midwife for most of us, certified professional midwife for most of that time. Um, prior to coming here, I was did the beginning of my training in Washington State. Um, mm -hmm. And I say that because they have um, licensure that predates the CPM credential even. And so the reason why I find this, and I guess at that time period as a young midwife, um, I thought that was the standard for sure. Like, you know, they had great consulting relationships, the transfers to hospitals were straightforward, um, you know, and the community of midwives worked really well together. And I, and I thought that that's really what I wanted. Um, but what I learned pretty quickly of coming to New England and specifically to Connecticut is that the culture is just different here. And so that's why I think to answer the question, like what's the measure of success for sure, what other people have said, yes, more access to care, um, you know, safe, 
healthy birth for mom and baby. Like those are all things that we want hands down. Um, but we've been living in this culture that's been, has been a little bit punitive. I mean, I, I worked through those, you know, for when the, the Albini case and, you know, and I saw all that happen. And so, you know, it was, it, and also very commonly, you know, talking to a pediatrician, less a pediatrician, but more like, you know, if we do have to transfer to the hospital, you know, a doctor who does not understand what I do, why I'm there, you know, and makes a lot of assumptions that aren't correct. So we live kind of assuming that people don't know who we are and what we do. And I'm kind of just tired of explaining it, <laughs> except to our clients very clearly and specifically. Um, so I guess, you know, opening up this subject, what does measure of success mean for us as professionals and for the community are, do go hand in hand, but are also separate questions. So I think we're still in a questioning place or I'll speak for myself. I'm in more of a questioning place and trying to understand what this might mean rather than saying this is clearly what we want and desire at this moment. Understood. Thanks for sharing that. And, you know, the relationship between law and culture is very complex um, and it doesn't just, you know, it's not going to flip a switch necessarily, but it could be part of that effort. And I think uh, the conversations that I've had with my policy director are very much that we understand that interest in, in changing the culture. Uh, L'Oreal. Hi, yes, I just wanted to to touch on what Ida was saying about traditional midwives and, um, you know, these conversations, it's it's like it's it's really intriguing and it, it all feels really interesting. You know, regulations and all of these things were birthed out of oppression and racism. And I do know that most traditional midwives are women of color. I don't think that we're talking a lot about this in, in these conversations. I know that Lucinta mentioned, and she did a really good job articulating um, last time in our last meeting, you know, I'm a, a meek trained midwife practicing as a traditional midwife. Um, I made the conscious decision to not certify with specific organizing bodies um, because of the deep problematic past that they have. Um, so I feel like if there's ways for us to have these conversations and it's a safe space for people like myself who want to practice and do need to practice, um, that would be helpful. But a big part of the decision to continue practicing as a tra traditional midwife is going back to my roots, the origins of my community. It's about self-preservation and preserving the people that I serve. Um, yeah, yeah, I just wanted to touch on that. Thank you. Thank you, Floriel, for sharing your perspective. Uh, Christina, do you have your hand up still? No, Genji. Um, yeah, so I've just been kind of taking notes along the way here, and I have, I think I have more real questions than suggestions as far as what something really, um, like what a goal would be or what success in this process would look like. Um, but I think that some of the common threads I see are some of the, the questions that need to be sort of um, extrapolated a little bit. Um, first of all, you know, like what, to say it a little bit of a different way, is like what will really unleash the power of midwifery? I mean, it's like well-documented across so many places that midwifery is what closes these disparity gaps. And midwifery is so broad because I think I said this last time, it's as old as birth itself. It predates mm -hmm. regulation, it predates credential, it predates criteria, it predates standards. And so much of it comes down to like, what is, what are the definitions of safety and high quality? You know, from, a, from different perspectives, safety and high quality mean different things. So on the one hand, safety might mean everybody survives. On the other hand, safety might mean they emerge like mentally and emotionally healthy. You know, so there's like so many layers to even what safety means. And then high quality, again, high quality is it just like you went to the very best, most wealth known um, program to get your learning? Or does quality mean that you have a cultural competency that is just un like surpasses your um, your education from a clinical point of view? But you're operating in a very, very safe and high quality way because you acknowledge your limitations of your ex of your education, you know, and that 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 someone operating there has like a midwife operating in that 
um, level is also providing like high quality care. And this is often, honestly, from the home birth community, this is often what we are finding is that that is exactly what families are seeking and why they are seeking care from midwives in the first place, regardless of how the midwife was trained. But then even on top of that, they're seeking care outside of the current medical system in Connecticut because mm -hmm. those things are not acknowledged as important. And they're not even part of the training that a lot of medical professionals have, not to the degree uh, beyond like, yes, disparities exist. Yes, you know, um, racism is a problem or, uh, but there's like a deep need for these, for, for like L'Oreal was just saying, like women who serve within the communities that they live within, you know? So, so really having like access to the full range of what a midwife, who a midwife might be and where she's come from is really what will provide the most access to that culturally competent care that that will hold families in a totally different way than just clinically competent care. And even, on, you know, birth happens no matter what, <laughs> birth is going to take place. And that's why we have births in cars and people who are like, you know, on their way. And here comes the baby when there's nobody there or even families who choose to not have a midwife or any provider at all because birth is meant to happen, you know, it will happen. And so high quality care doesn't always need to be someone who has like a, a sterile, uh, understands every single complication and every single option for handling that complication, you know? So it's a tricky question to, to try to define even like that, or what is safety in birth? Like, you know, what kind of safety are we talking about as well as sometimes there are provider interventions that actually cause problems. <laughs> And someone that's someone who's acting in like the full scope of their clinical understanding, but they're actually causing a problem for this this baby or this mother. So that's another piece of trying to understand all that, you know, and, and midwifery crosses those boundaries. Again, no matter how, what your training is, as a midwife, you're crossing those, those um, clinical lines into in like, uh, not just physical, like, the crossing the lines of physical health into like emotional health, behavioral health, mental health. I mean, we see whole families. We understand the dynamic between couples. We know, you know, that it makes a difference if a mom's having her first baby or her seventh baby or her third baby. Like there's just other questions to have, um, you know, come into that. And I love the parts of this that are like, we don't have to legitimize the profession anymore. We really, you know, even as midwives need to step out of feeling like we're working under this microscope where we have to do everything perfectly, or we're going to get, you know, um, something bad's going to happen, or we're going to be limited in our ability to practice, you know, and to, to keep it, to me, success looks like there's, there's um, a lot of emphasis on that the citizens of Connecticut, the public is intelligent and that they can choose, they can make choices around who is going to be part of this really like sacred event and important event. And, you know, talking about respect, I think that the, the non-nurse midwives, um, for sure. And I think all midwives, everyone I interview for, for care already has a deep respect for midwives. So the question of respect, like whose respect are we hoping to gain? And is that something that regulation is actually going to help with or not? Does it even matter? Um, you know, we have accountability pieces in our communities in lots of ways. Some of them are from the, the credentialing body and some of them are just like the way we hold each other as midwives. You know, I think that's one thing as midwives that we're, we're trying to figure out right now is like, you know, do we even want another layer of accountability? Do the things that are already in place, are they enough? They've been enough for a very long time. And so maybe maybe we don't need another layer of accountability. I think that there's a cultural piece there where, um, you know, professionals, especially professionals in birth who are working outside of the midwifery profession, they, ha they know what accountability looks like for them. Mm -hmm. So that they're hoping that something like that, that's familiar and comfortable and that they can just sort of take the shortcut and rely on is what will come out of all these meetings. But I'm not sure that that's actually what's best for midwifery. Um, there, I, I really, you know, would think it would be amazing to to really, really, truly step out outside of all the boxes, step out of the boxes of being scared of being disciplined, step out of the boxes of this is what birth has, has looked like for the last hundred years. So that's the measure to, you know, step outside of, of this, the division within midwifery itself and be like, what could something look like that? What did create like a midwifery, a full 
fully recognized, fully respected, fully like engaged midwifery profession that is standing beside the, you know, maternal fetal medicine and the emergency things and the very complicated pregnancies, like where you need a whole, you need a whole host of folks who have special t information and special training to help a mom and a baby come through that experience safely. So, you know, what, what would that look like? Um, I think that, um, you know, one of the things I really appreciate about all of this is that, especially every time Chris says something, he really communicates that that midwifery and obstetrics are two completely different professions. I think that is huge. Um, and the individual individualized care should be the standard of care. You know, what is that? But that's something that's hard. It's messy. It's not, you can't, you know, package it up neatly and just say, hey, everybody, this is what this looks like. And everyone says, oh, we know what that is. So that's, you know, a, a place where I think success would look like really being able to bring that in to whatever happens um, or that a huge part of the consideration of what happens um, going forward and, and not taking those shortcuts. Um, yeah, I think that that's kind of all, all my notes. I think that I hope that didn't sound like a, a crazy ramble, but I think basically, you know, going back to something that, that you had said, Chris, at one of our meetings before we started these work meetings was like, you know, Connecticut can be on the leading edge of something in, in completely different outside of all those things that Dante sent. They, you know, they're okay. Some of them and some of them are horrible. Um, <laughs> you're just like oh well the state of texas is in charge of what my scope of practice is like that's that's not what any of us that's not going to benefit anyone that's not going to create more safety that's not going to help the public that's definitely not going to help midwives and so you know for connecticut to to really walk slowly through this process and to really truly like mary lawler said like make sure that the voice of midwives is part of every single discussion like that's one of the things that i'm just coming away from here is like okay once these meetings are done and the, any ball starts rolling forward like how do we make sure there is like fair representation every step of the way because nobody knows who we are and what we do so um so yeah so so i just want to invite everyone into that to just like you know, the more that I think the midwife, we as midwives can really put our arms around understanding this whole process that has been initiated here, because there's a lot more to it than what we've even know from these meetings right now, that the more we can put our arms around that and that the the DPH and the legislature and all the, those powers that be can like help us stay in this slow place of really discovering what this all is and, and the real answers to these questions, I think the better off midwifery is going to be, Connecticut's going to be, the people are going to be, like, it could be something really, really glorious if we just try to stay out of like, well, they did this over here, that's good enough, let's do that, you know, and really continue this. So I, I have a lot of respect for where we've come through this whole thing. And and so, so thank you. <laughs> thank you, Genji. And I, I want to reassure everyone that um, there is no conclusion. The conclusion will come from this group. It will come from what everyone is saying here. Like, the outcome when we're done with this short period of the work group is whatever the group decides in a lot of ways in terms of, of what recommendations we put together or, or how we, we sort of frame uh, the input that we've received from all of you. Um, Chris, I see your hand is up. I don't know if you. Yeah, no, thank you. You both just said it. So Genji, thank you for your kind of entree. And then Dante kind of went into it. But the reason I raised my hand was I, would ju I just wanted to reassure, reassure everyone, like, there's no rush to come to like the end final conclusion of any. And sometimes you can't do that in a couple months. Um, and I don't feel like we're going to be able to. So you know, we have to, you know, we have to let the legislature know what happened, but what could happen is the report could say, yeah, we need to work on this. We need to work with a broader group of folks. We need to pull in more people. We need to really iron this out more before we figure out what direction this will or will not go into. So, so, I, so thank you, everybody. I really appreciate it. And I'm loving all this discussion and meeting with all of you. It, it's, it's, it's great. So thank you. Just one more thing on that. If it helps people to really, um, think of, of what that would look like. It could be just like a phrase where the legislature then says, you need to, you know, DPH will continue to convene a group with this or that mandate as we move forward. Like just continue the conversation in some some way and that's okay. Uh, Lucinda. 
we have time for a few more. OK, I'll be very quick. I, I just wanted to say, because uh, I think I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, Gen Genji. You said something very important. Success is not just about a baby and a mom at the end. Success is about that whole experience of care. And I'm just brush off a situation where a mom is being discharged home and she can't feel her legs. You know, her provider's not listening to her. So I'm, I'm in another state and I have to call her provider to say she can't feel her legs. And so they decide to keep her. So it's about the experience of care and midwifery. There's certain things that can't be measured. It's our relationship that we have with the woman, how we listen to her. I can't tell you how many women call me and say, my doctor wants me to do this, or this happened to me. And, and then I'm just telling, I'm, t I'm explaining to them, I'm not even there. I'm explaining the medication. And they're like, well, how come they didn't tell me that? So when we're looking at success, we have to also look at what's already happening to, with other providers first. But I'm just saying with midwifery, I think that this process should be slow because we have to be able to, and I know it's like we're constantly explaining what midwifery care is, what midwives do. And so we already know it's the system that needs to know. And if they don't understand, if they don't understand then this process is not gonna work out. It's not gonna work out and that's our, that's our history. Especially when it really comes to women getting what they need, I should say birthing people, I just feel like we're, there's something that's good that's happening. And sometimes, and I know the state's intentions are good, but sometimes there's often more harm in that process. And we know there's people on this call who know midwives who want this to work out, but then there's others who will take that regulation. I know what it's like when you're delivering a baby and there's a provider over you waiting for you to make a mistake just because they think you shouldn't be there. So I'm just saying that we just have to be careful of whatever is decided, and hopefully this is a slow process, but it's listening again to what midwives are doing. And instead of saying, how are we gonna punish? And I keep going back to this, because even the metrics used to determine what success, that's problematic for me. Thank you, Lucinda. Um, Amy, we haven't heard from you yet. Did you call on me or the other Amy? Uh, Amy Cole, I think. Had That's her what hand. I thought. I was like, I didn't have my hand up, but <laughs> <laughs> happy to share. I'm not, I'm not sure why my hand is up. Oh, okay. Thank you. No problem. Okay, then in that case, uh, thank you, Lucinda, for sharing that. And I think, um, you know, this has been a really fruitful conversation for everybody to hear the depth and um, and and breadth of what success could or could not mean. Um, I think at this time, you know, we're we're heading into the last few minutes of the call, and I think moving forward, you know, I think the purpose of sharing what other states have done really in a lot of ways is to see if there are pieces that have worked and then what hasn't worked. And of course, every state has its own story of midwives and their interaction with the state and um, their their history um, with, you know, with the state and with the law and, and with the culture of the place that they're in. And so, um, you know, I think, uh, I think we we all sort of a common thread is that you know we do want families and communities to understand what midwives bring and and maybe something to think about moving forward is whether there are more families out there in Connecticut who could benefit from learning about midwives and what they do and and whether there are ways that we could enhance access in that way. Um, and so I'll just leave it open for any last comments before we wrap up the call. Um, any last questions, uh, things people want to make sure that we get into next time so I can kind of pin them um, to bring up. Um, 
All right, I, go ahead. I, I'd like to ask if we might send the link to the call on the morning that we're hosting the call instead of going back several weeks through emails to find it. Is, would that be possible? Sure, no problem. Because all those links were sent out quite a long time ago. And then then you got to find it that morning. That's, that was my request. Thanks, Shana. Thank you, and I I really uh, value everyone um, sharing, and and hopefully we continue continue to have a place where people um, feel comfortable raising their voices, whatever they may have to say, even you know, if you think, you know, I just want everyone to feel that they're going to be well received, and that we're happy to have you here, and that we're here to listen to all of you. Um, so I think with that, we're probably going to wrap up until two weeks from now. And in the meantime, if you want to send resources that you'd like me to share with the group, I'm happy to, to take those and, and just distribute them um, as we continue thinking about everything. Thank you, Thank everyone. Thank you very much.